This is the DMT One to One Show, Episode Nine, an interview with the Bloom FM recorded at Liverpool Sound City. We're here at Liverpool Sound City with uh, Oleg Fomenko, the CEO of uh, the company Bloom uh, FM. So, hi, Oleg, and how's it going? Um, it's going very well. I'm I'm, I'm quite glad that uh, panels are over. I'm, yeah. <laughs> I'm always uh, I'm nervous when uh, when these things happen. Um, Andrea was uh, managing a panel, and uh, I thought it went very well. We we, we did get into a couple of uh, debates, but um, yeah. I thought it was uh, productive. And uh, you know, the guys on the panel were uh, sort of amazing. Um, in terms of combination of skills and uh, experiences. So, you know, yeah. to be honest, that changed my point of view slightly on uh, one of the points. So, you know, it's very it's productive, good. I think. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's, it's not a good panel if there's, if there's no disagreements at all. Uh, so, you know, it means that it wasn't good enough. Uh, so uh, let's talk about Bloom FM. You know, I think uh, uh, you guys have made some strides uh, in the last three months since you launched officially. Uh, so it was at the beginning of January. And then you announced uh, uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago that you already reached uh, 100,000 uh, um, so, know, users that have signed up to the, to the app. Uh, very interesting new uh, streaming uh, application, which is available in the UK. So if you are in the UK, I strongly recommend that you go and check out uh, Bloom.fm on the iOS uh, app store. Uh, for now, it's only iOS. And so, first of all, uh, you know, tell me all about how how Bloom FM started and how you got the idea for the company and how you went about uh, getting it together. Wow, that's a big one. Uh, <laughs> um, it started uh, quite a long time ago uh, with uh, um, you know me being very passionate about uh, collecting vinyl, and uh, uh, when. Uh, MP3s came along, and uh, um, you know, MP3 players started to come about, and then I heard of uh, Napster, and uh, then it was this thing Winamax. Um, I was living in Vienna back then, and uh, at the party, I actually ran into a musician who, um, you know, kind of we started conversing about uh, uh, about sort of technology and MP3, and I realized that uh, you know his livelihood virtually sort of disappeared uh, with the advent of uh, piracy and. Uh, you know, I was always into music, you know, uh, artists were the people that, uh, um, you know, I thought were actually in need of being rewarded and supported so that, you know, I can continue to enjoy their music. And, uh, you know, I thought that I needed to do something, but it took quite a long time, um, uh, only in the year 2008, so stars aligned and uh, I was able to um, kind of have a feeling that, I knew enough people in the industry to uh, kind of go and talk to them and, you know, suss out how we're going to license the idea. Yeah. Um, I knew some people who, uh, you know, I thought would be great in the team and uh, started having conversations with them. Um, and uh, I also started feeling that uh, um, I knew people who potentially could be backers uh, of uh, this venture. So I quit my uh, sort of stable pretty well paid job back then uh, my wife was pregnant with the uh, um, you know with our first uh, um, uh, kid and she was six months pregnant and we've decided that I need to quit back then because if uh, um, our son well we didn't know that it was son back then but uh, if our son came about then I probably being a responsible person would not have made a jump and thank God I did um, it's been a rocky ride it took about a year to turn PowerPoint idea into, um, um, you know, some form of a company, uh, get commitment from people to uh, sort of join us and get uh, a sort of first round of seed funding coming in. And uh, then we sort of went on uh, um, developing what, uh, um, you know, subsequently was known as Mflow. Unfortunately, that project has been scrapped. Well, actually, fortunately, um, and, uh, um, you know, but we learned an awful lot. Uh, so unlike some startups that probably, you know, kind of give up and move on, um, you know, we were able to regroup. Uh, we were able to convince our investors to, uh, you know, uh, back this new and changed product uh, that is now called Bloom. Back then it was kind of Mflow Make 2. And, uh, yeah, it's been a fantastic ride. And uh, um, as you have mentioned, we've been uh, fairly rapidly acquiring users. So we have acquired 100,000 registered users. Uh, and, uh, you know, they can be on 3, 1, 5, and 10. 
That's great. And uh, and so uh, you know, of course, you have a, a one pound subscription, which ex- gives people access to uh, twenty tracks in, in a locker, which is uh, uh, you know they, they can stream the music offline from the phones, and then five pounds for fifty tracks, and then uh, so two hundred tracks, yeah. two hundred tracks, yeah, five pounds for two hundred tracks, and then it's unlimited for ten pounds. So similarly priced to 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 uh, similar services like uh, like Audio and Spotify. And so, um, what uh, got you to choose those price tiers, and and how hard were the negotiations to get uh, those tiers? Uh, a lower down to of course what is a fairly steep enterprise these uh, these days yeah um, i think it's very important to say that uh, uh, you know when we were when we started working on bloom there were two strands to our work one was we wanted to have an exceptionally good product and here um, our uh, cto and co-founder uh, tom nguyen uh, that was his primary responsibility so we were absolutely keen on making sure that we are focused on mobile and again it was sort of Tom's single, you know, kind of mindedness that, you know, kind of created that focus. Uh, so yes. it's absolutely brilliant. And, uh, you know, kind of striving for design and beauty. So from outset, we wanted to create a product that would stand out for its um, perfection, for its OCDness of kind of detail, uh, how everything worked, that there were no bugs in it, and everything that it does, it does better than any other service out there. So, you know, that was one strand. And another strand was consumer proposition. And here, the key for us was to go mainstream. Only 12% of uh, UK smartphone users uh, ever tried streaming service, according to Mintel 2012, I think. And, uh, you know, 88% of people never tried streaming service. The key issue that we've, you know, kind of uh, learned was uh, that there is affordability. Um, I think I mentioned to you, uh, you know, kind of in passing uh, before the... Uh, before the panel, that uh, 2008 in the UK, average consumer who was paying for music, that I believe was pr- about 50% of U- UK kind of uh, uh, grown up population, was spending 63 quid a year uh, on music. Now, if you are consuming music on a mobile phone, which is everyone who's got a smartphone, uh, right now the entry price point is 120 quid a year. How can this be that this price point would be mainstream and everyone would, you know, kind of start paying it? Yeah. It's impossible. So our thinking was we need to create tiers that would engage, you know, large chunks of uh, the audience that is spending money, is willing to spend money, but just cannot afford to spend the amount of money that is currently being offered to them. So how did one quid came about? It was very um, kind of uh, simple. You needed to think what is happening in fans' head at the moment. For a lot of fans, music is free. As soon as you start talking to them about, you know, buying a track for one pound, uh, listen for a track for XP, for them, it immediately translates into a value equation where you sell music to them which they can get for free it's not it's not that it has to be free but you they can get it for free and therefore the to convince them is very very hard so we started thinking how can we make sure that we remove this you know immediate concern that pops in people's heads and this is why we've created a proposition where you get effectively a you know you probably used um, you know big yellow storage or you know something you know where you keep your boxes you just get space and then you can put a box in there two boxes three boxes what you know however many you can fit you can come in as many times as you want take boxes put boxes back in that's what we effectively created we created a wallet of music that for one pound contains 20 tracks you can swap them in and out as soon as you mention swapping in and out the mathematical calculation can no longer be made and people are actually going oh that's a very attractive price point because this is spare change in my pocket. I can lose one quid. It will be sitting in the back of my sofa. I wouldn't even worry about it until pizza man knocks on the door and I don't have a tip. Now, all of a sudden it becomes, why the hell not? You know, it's such a keen price. And the biggest issue we have in the industry is to make people start paying, to engage them into legal services. So we wanted to make it very easy. So that's how one quid and the proposition of the locker came about. We've experimented and we spent quite a bit of time looking at, you know, various different amounts of uh, tracks and locker. And of course, you know, we would want to give as much as possible, but, you know, we need to be, you know, keeping an eye on being able to license it. And we're going to get to that in a second. So, you know, but we were able to kind of build a story 
to labels and with labels in the fact uh, in fact you know some of them have been immensely supportive that if we have a very good upsell story if there is a positive reason for people to move from one to five to ten rather than them having to make a decision go from zero to ten in one go or to have a cut down service that really doesn't make a lot of sense where you feel like it's not really a service it's just that service with lots of features being disabled that's not a very positive thing so we just you know put this basis out there it took a long time the original kind of conversations with labels you know were oh my god you know are you sure that you know we need to go that low however once they saw the product once they saw the basis of a proposition once they kind of started feeling that it was something that they would use themselves uh the conversation changed uh uh, very very quickly one thing that you know i cannot go into sort of numbers of subscribers but one thing that i can mention is that we are not having uh, our paid customers sitting on one pound which was a fear of a lot of users what we're seeing is uh you know yes a lot of customers come in use free service try one pound and be, given that we're only three months, what we what, what we expect will happen is that as the usage intensifies and you know they kind of they they engage with the service and understand the benefit, we're going to start seeing them going to five and ten. That's my hope. You know, I would certainly want to generate more revenues for artists than less. However, I don't want to have a business model which seems to generate a lot of revenue for artists, but nobody just pays for it. Of course, and 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 the, and the problem is that. Of course, uh, it, we, you're talking about the fact that you know that the average consumer would only spend about you know sixty pounds or so a year on music. So and it was in 2008. Right now, this number yeah. must be lower. Yeah, exactly. You know, this number cannot be higher than fifty quid at the moment. Yeah, and that's for and that's for a music fan. It's not. For, yeah, it's it's yes. for for a music fan. And so and and here it's interesting actually because you know you get to a point where uh, if you have a one pound or a five pound a month subscription, then you you end up spending between anywhere between twelve and sixty pounds a year, and then if you're still somebody that is willing to buy physical uh, you know downloads or yes. physical CDs, then you start see uh, seeing it uh, more of a, as a two way street uh, in the way that you consume music. Because in uh, for example, I, I use Spotify, and it's pretty rare that I these days I, I buy any CDs anymore because I think oh, I just cost Spotify and paying so much money for it then uh, I might as well use it as much as possible unless I absolutely you know really really want to release and so this kind of gives you an avenue to be able to do both at the same time um, uh, absolutely I, I think that uh, this is uh, now pretty sort of much universally accepted uh, uh, in the music industry that uh, um, every new service that actually is attractive for consumers it adds you know, kind of, it, it brings in revenue. So, yeah. you know, if people are streaming, you know, a lot of people would continue buying. Like, you know, for example, in my case, um, I do, of course, use our service, but, you know, sometimes I want to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, I can also put this for my kids and we have for them, you know, one of those kind of old uh, sort of CD decks that you know I'm 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 a little bit nervous about giving them my iPhone because they've deleted once uh, my contacts library, <laughs> so you know I I prefer to give them a CD and uh, you know I continue buying things that I think are are, are worthy uh, sort of spending money on. Sure. So especially when I'm thinking about the low spending user, the biggest issue that I saw in these consumers when you actually talk to them is lack of engagement they don't know what they want to listen to they do not you know quite often this would be young people they don't travel in the car they don't listen to a lot of radio uh, when they're in the office they are not really listening to uh, radio so there is no new kind of music is coming in somebody else is putting together playlists the they do not have confidence in their music taste and therefore, what you really need to do is you need to engage them. You need to make them very, you know, the path to listen to music very easy. And uh, your suggestions need to be bloody good. And with one click on our service, you can just put this track into your phone and make it available on and offline. So all of a sudden, you can actually hear something, go, mm, love it, jump in the tube and enjoy it where right now basically sort of streaming services would normally work or you would need to sideload and make sure that everything is synced. Yeah. So yes, you know, to come back to your question, I think that everything drives uh, kind of more spend and is not substitutional or cannibalizing.
Awesome. Well, it's a it's actually a beautiful app. You know, we talked about the business model for the most part of the interview, but it's actually a really nicely designed and, and simple to use app. So I think you know, uh, if if just to check out how it works, you should uh, go and download it anyway, and then see see if it suits you. But uh, it's it's really nice, and it's also got like a pro- proximity type thing, so you can pass the yes. track onto somebody else. So yes. how did that feature come about? Oh, uh, again, this is, uh, uh, you know, kind of, we have very talented technical team and our uh, CTO, whose uh, name I already mentioned, Tom and Guyen, he, uh, he, his belief, and I totally, so, so totally subscribe to it, that uh, um, technology is there to make our lives easier. So there are certain things that we do right now. You know, I go, Andrea, I've just heard this unbelievable track. This, you know, it's absolutely superb. Now technology allows you not just mention it, and then Andrea needs to kind of try to remember, get home, yes, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, or take a note, and then try to search for it on <laughs> iTunes or go, God forbid, onto Bit uh, BitTorrent or you know whatever, and download it. You know, right now I can just simply kind of go share track. And if we are on the same Wi-Fi, your name would automatically pop up and I would just sort of choose you and you instantly would get a notification uh, on uh, in your app awesome. and uh, you'd be able to um, see uh, and play this track straight away. Yeah. I can actually, you know, I can demonstrate to you the sort of whole process because we don't really have Wi-Fi here. But, oh, exactly, yeah. you know, here is my inbox. Yeah. And here are the people that shared uh, tracks with me. So Tom has sent me a track. I just click on that, and voila! And this happens instantly. That's great. So, yeah. Um, other interesting things that uh, we're doing, and uh, you know, it's um, it is totally unique. Um, I think earlier I've uh, upgraded uh, your subscription. Yeah. Yeah. So in order for us to share stuff, because. Um, um, you know, we b- we believe that the start of sharing should be one to one when you have a good conversation, and then all of a sudden, hey, have you heard that now? Uh, so I can send the track to a person who is on the same Wi-Fi, but if we're sitting next to each other, what I can also do is you can click on receive a track, yeah. and the person sending just basically takes a screenshot of your screen and you automatically receive that uh, uh you know uh that track so you know there are plenty of things that we do that just make it you know do you remember bump you know yeah. there was an app yeah. so it's basically kind of you you know you you take a screen of uh, or you take a screen grab of my phone and i automatically receive the track that you want to share with me yeah. So, you know, very simple, very easy, no need to type anything, no need to push it into sort of Facebook, you know, just human interaction made, you know, kind of enhanced by technology and the app. And finally, uh, I just wanted to mention, because it's awesome, uh, that I saw that you have a barcode scanner for CDs. And uh, it's something that I've heard people uh, talk, ask for uh, from a lot of other streaming applications, just so that they could go and match what they have at home with uh, some of the other stuff. So is, th- is that the nature of why you put it in there? Or is it more for, for if, if a friend gives you a CD and says, this is really awesome, you can scan it and then get it on, on, on uh, Bloom automatically? Uh, I you know I, I think that all of us gone through digitizing of uh, uh, of uh, of your collection. And uh, you know my collection now still is probably about 600 you know, maybe 700 CDs, and it was multiple times that. And uh, I lost my collection probably twice. Um, and uh, right now, I find it immensely easy to just simply, you know, if somebody, and you know, there are a few and few CDs around, but just simply taking barcode takes you to page. And what we have is we have a borrow album yeah. button. So what you do is, you know, if CD is in front of you, uh, you you basically have this CD digitized and put into your pocket with about two clicks. Okay. So That's convenience, awesome. simplicity, and you know all that stuff that technology should be so good at doing. Great. Well, that's awesome. I look forward to see, hearing more about Bloom FM in the next few months. And thanks so much for your time. And check out Bloom FM on the iOS App Store if you're in the UK. Of course, if you are elsewhere, uh, check out uh, the site. Uh, is it Bloom.fm as well, the site? Yes, it's Bloom.fm. Uh, and uh, come over to our Facebook page. I do believe that we also uh, keep track of people who are abroad 
but interested in Bloom. So as soon as we are available in your market, you'd be the first person to know. So come and register and uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll certainly be keeping in touch. Great. We are planning to expand, but we would like to make sure that we really perfect all of our apps and uh, uh, you know, make sure that you know, our proposition works for everyone, artists and fans alike, and then we're gonna be pushing it out uh, uh, very aggressively. Great. Awesome, thank you. Thank you very much, good to be here. If you enjoyed the show, remember to check out our weekly music tech news show on digitalmusictrans.com.